June 3rd, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 1 Kings chapters 19 and 20 from the Old Testament. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, including a detailed account of how he killed all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with this warning, May the gods judge me severely if by this time tomorrow I do not take your life as you did theirs. Elijah was afraid, so he got up and fled for his life to Beersheba in Judah. He left his servant there while he went a day's journey into the desert. He went and sat down under a shrub and asked the Lord to take his life. I've had enough. Now, O Lord, take my life. After all, I'm no better than my ancestors. He stretched out and fell asleep under the shrub. All of a sudden, an angelic messenger touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked and right there by his head was a cake baking on hot coals and a jug of water. He ate and drank and then slept some more. The Lord's angelic messenger came back again, touched him and said, get up and eat for otherwise you won't be able to make the journey. So he got up and ate and drank. That meal gave him the strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb the mountain of God. He went into a cave there and spent the night. All of a sudden, the Lord spoke to him. Why are you here, Elijah? He answered, I have been absolutely loyal to the Lord, the sovereign God, even though the Israelites have abandoned the agreement they made with you, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and now they want to take my life. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Look, the Lord is ready to pass by. A very powerful wind went before the Lord, digging into the mountain and causing landslides, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the windstorm, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his robe and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. All of a sudden a voice asked him, Why are you here, Elijah? He answered, I have been absolutely loyal to the Lord, the sovereign God, even though the Israelites have abandoned the agreement they made with you, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and now they want to take my life. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and then head for the desert of Damascus. Go and anoint Hazael, king over Syria. You must anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, king over Israel, and Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to take your place as prophet. Jehu will kill anyone who escapes Hazael's sword, and Elisha will kill anyone who escapes Jehu's sword. I still have left in Israel 7,000 followers who have not bowed their knees to Baal or kissed the images of him. Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen. He was near the 12th pair. Elijah passed by him and threw his robe over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. Then I will follow you. Elijah said to him, Go back. Indeed, what have I done to you? Elisha went back and took his pair of oxen and slaughtered them. He cooked the meat over a fire that he made by burning the harness and yoke. He gave the people meat and they ate. Then he got up and followed Elijah and became his assistant. Now King Ben-Hadad of Syria assembled all his army, along with 32 other kings with their horses and chariots. He marched against Samaria and besieged and attacked it. He sent messengers to King Ahab of Israel, who was in the city. He said to him, This is what Ben-Hadad says, Your silver and your gold are mine, as well as the best of your wives and sons. The king of Israel replied, It is just as you say, my master, O king. I and all I own belong to you. The messengers came again and said, This is what Ben-Hadad says. I sent this message to you. You must give me your silver, gold, wives, and sons. 
By now at this time tomorrow, I will send my servants to you and they will search through your palace and your servants' houses. They will carry away all your valuables. The king of Israel summoned all the leaders of the land and said, Notice how this man is looking for trouble. Indeed, he demanded my wives, sons, silver, and gold, and I did not resist him. All the leaders and people said to him, Do not give in or agree to his demands. So he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Say this to my master, the king. I will give you everything you demanded at first from your servant, but I am unable to agree to this latest demand. So the messengers went back and gave their report. Ben-Hadad sent another message to him. May the gods judge me severely if there is enough dirt left in Samaria for my soldiers to scoop up in their hands. The king of Israel replied, Tell him the one who puts on his battle gear should not boast like one who is taking it off. When Ben-Hadad received this reply, he and the other kings were drinking in their quarters. He ordered his servants, Get ready to attack. So they got ready to attack the city. Now a prophet visited King Ahab of Israel and said, This is what the Lord says. Do you see this huge army? Look, I am going to hand it over to you this very day. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Ahab asked, By whom will this be accomplished? He answered, This is what the Lord says. By the servants of the district governors. Ahab asked, Who will launch the attack? He answered, You will. So Ahab assembled the 232 servants of the district governors. After that, he assembled all the Israelite army, numbering 7,000. They marched out at noon while Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings allied with him were drinking heavily in their quarters. The servants of the district governors led the march. When Ben-Hadad sent messengers, they reported back to him. Men are marching out of Samaria. He ordered, whether they come in peace or to do battle, take them alive. They march out of the city with the servants of the district governors in the lead and the army behind them. Each one struck down an enemy soldier. The Syrians fled and Israel chased them. King Ben-Hadad of Syria escaped on horseback with some horsemen. Then the king of Israel marched out and struck down the horses and chariots. He thoroughly defeated Syria. The prophet visited the king of Israel and instructed him, Go, fortify your defenses. Determine what you must do, for in the spring the king of Syria will attack you. Now the advisers of the king of Syria said to him, Their god is a god of the mountains. That's why they overpowered us. But if we fight them in the plains, we will certainly overpower them. So do this. Dismiss the kings from their command and replace them with military commanders. Muster an army like the one you lost, with the same number of horses and chariots. Then we will fight them in the plains. We will certainly overpower them. He approved their plan and did as they advised. In the spring, Ben-Hadad mustered the Syrian army and marched to Aphek to fight Israel. When the Israelites had mustered and had received their supplies, they marched out to face them in battle. When the Israelites deployed opposite them, they were like two small flocks of goats, but the Syrians filled the land. The prophet visited the king of Israel and said, This is what the Lord says, because the Syrians said, The Lord is a God of the mountains and not a God of the valleys. I will hand over to you this entire huge army. Then you will know that I am the Lord. The armies were deployed opposite each other for seven days. On the seventh day the battle began, and the Israelites killed a hundred thousand Syrian foot soldiers in one day. The remaining twenty-seven thousand ran to Aphak and went into the city, but the wall fell on them. Now Ben-Hadad ran into the city and hid in an inner room. His advisers said to him, Look, we have heard that the kings of the Israelite dynasty are kind. Allow us to put sackcloth around our waist and ropes on our heads and surrender to the king of Israel. Maybe he will spare our lives. So they put sackcloth around their waist and ropes on their heads and went to the king of Israel. They said, 
Your servant Ben Haydad says, please let me live. Ahab replied, is he still alive? He is my brother. The men took this as a good omen and quickly accepted his offer, saying, Ben Hadad is your brother. Ahab then said, Go get him. So Ben Hadad came out to him, and Ahab pulled him up into his chariot. Ben Hadad said, I will return the cities my father took from your father. You may set up markets in Damascus, just as my father did in Samaria. Ahab then said, I want to make a treaty with you before I dismiss you. So he made a treaty with him and then dismissed him. One of the members of the prophetic guild, speaking with divine authority, ordered his companion, Wound me. But the man refused to wound him. So the prophet said to him, Because you have disobeyed the Lord, as soon as you leave me, a lion will kill you. When he left him, a lion attacked and killed him. He found another man and said, Wound me. So the man wounded him severely. The prophet then went and stood by the road waiting for the king. He also disguised himself by putting a bandage down over his eyes. When the king passed by, he called out to the king. Your servant went out into the heat of the battle, and then a man turned aside and brought me a prisoner. He told me, guard this prisoner. If he ends up missing for any reason, you will pay with your life or with a talent of silver. Well, it just so happened that while your servant was doing this and that, he disappeared. The king of Israel said to him, Your punishment is already determined by your own testimony. The prophet quickly removed the bandage from his eyes, and the king of Israel recognized he was one of the prophets. The prophet then said to him, This is what the Lord says, Because you released a man I had determined should die, you will pay with your life, and your people will suffer instead of his people. The king of Israel went home to Samaria, bitter and angry. God, thank you for the story of Elijah. I think sometimes when, when we're going hard for you, when we're on fire for you, when, when it's all about you and, and we think we're just taking all the right steps somebody like a queen jezebel will come into our life and and make us forget everything that we know all of the faith that elijah had his strength in you god his his belief in your power and your sovereignty it, in just a split moment completely went away now, whether that's a person or a situation or event that happens to us, we've all been there. We all know that those types of things can just suck the life out of you instantly. And, and then we watch Elijah kind of go into a tailspin. And I've been there. I was there just a few months ago <laughs> where n nothing is going to work. You you have given up. You're defeated. Um, you're depressed. Um Sometimes people get suicidal at this point, and Elijah's like, just take me now, God, I, I'm done. And I think what's, what's really fascinating is this high that Elijah was on, where you just came and took care of that so-called other God and the other prophets and uh, showed him who was boss. <laughs> and Elijah was on this amazing high, and then this evil, evil queen who has been killing prophets, your prophets, God, um, says, and I'll get you to my, my pretty Elijah. And Elijah freaks out. And then he becomes exhausted. He becomes depressed. And then I think what is fascinating is as, as you send your messenger into his life to say, hey, God's coming. First and foremost... There's a big wind, big, loud wind. And then there's a great big, huge landslide. And then after the landslide, great big, huge earthquake. And then after the earthquake, great big, huge fire. And then after all of that, in a super quiet whisper, you show up. And I think sometimes when we're at the what we think is the very end, when we get to that point where we're sobbing on our bed, just begging for you to not 
let us wake up in the morning because we can't handle things anymore. We can't handle our our disability or a disease we have. We can't handle a spouse. We can't handle the job we have. We can't handle persecution. And we just beg you to take it all away. We still have to go through a wind. We still have to go through a landslide. We still have to go through an earthquake. And then we still have to go through a fire. And then you come in very quietly and say, why are you here, my child? Why are you here, Elijah? Why are you at the spot? And through your grace and through your mercy and through your love, I always remember after coming through all that, just shaking my head, wondering what happened? How did I get so far away from you, God? How, how did I get so far away from the truth of what was happening? Um, how did I get so incredibly micro-focused on just one event, or in Elijah's case, this one queen, and I, I forget the totality of your sovereignty, forget the, the totality of your control of this world, and I get completely lost. And then in your gentleness, you kindly <laughs> remind me, why are you where you're at, you know? I'm right here with you. Let's find your way back. Let me help you. And we work back to the spot we were so that that relationship can continue to grow. God, today I do thank you for the windstorms. I thank you for the landslides. There's been a few lately. Uh, I thank you for the earthquakes. Those were last year. I thank you for the huge fires. Because those shape and develop and grow my relationship with you. Not a big fan of going through those things. They're really, really hard. But it's also when I grow the most as your child. What is my biggest blessing though? Is after going through all of those. Is the fact that your voice is there. It hasn't gone anywhere. You haven't gone anywhere. You are still there for me. You always were there for me until I could dig myself out of this hole that I found myself into. God, thank you. Thank you for the gentleness of your voice when we have pushed you so far, far away. And thank you for your grace and mercy as we find our way back to you after the fire. In your son's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>